joining me. I am now joined and going to be having a wonderful chat with multi-talented writer, producer and director, Chris Chapman. Chris, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. No problem at all. Lovely to, lovely to be able to chat with you. Um, how are you finding life in these uh, slightly unusual times? <laughs> well, I, I, weirdly, I, I'm still filming <laughs> is, is the very strange situation at the moment. So I'm mostly in lockdown, uh, but I'm working for uh, BBC Countryfile at the moment alongside the Doctor Who stuff. And so I go out once every fortnight and do a little bit of filming with social distancing. So weirdly, I'm kind of I'm very fortunate to still be working, but doing so in a very weird way where you have to keep if two people are talking, you have to keep them two metres apart and I have to keep two metres apart from the people that we're filming and I have to kind of anti-back all the kit and all the, you know, people have to, I have to anti-back uh, radio microphones to leave in plastic bags, inside plastic bags for somebody to pick out and self-mic and put the mic on. So very strange times, uh, obviously very interesting slash awful, uh, but we're, we're doing okay. We've got a, a year and a half old toddler here who's rampaging through the house. So it's kind of making sure she is entertained, educated, and doesn't destroy the house. So it's all balancing, really, I think. I was going to say, not, not just balancing, juggling act. Uh, yes. Is, is, is the sound of it. It, <laughs> it sounds, like, sounds like quite the thing you're up to. Um, to give yeah. our viewers an idea, I know their focus, uh, despite all the other wonderful work you've done, stuff for CBBC, <laughs> such as our school, BAFTA nominated documentaries, uh, writing for Big Finish, all of these things, um, which are all wonderful, but I know the focus very much for our viewers is going to be the work <laughs> you do for the lovely, fantastic uh, Blu-ray box sets. Do you just want to give an idea, if you can, um, to those watching what your role in those uh, productions is? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I guess I kind of came late into the DVD era of Doctor Who as a, as a director and a producer. And uh, I came in in about 2008 on those releases. So I was a bit late to the party and I missed a lot of the, of the, the releases that had come out. And for years I'd been thinking, oh, I love Doctor Who and I buy these DVDs and they make documentaries. <laughs> and then I started making documentaries and I was like, oh, well, I should, I should be pitching because I, that's what I do now. And I could do it about Doctor Who. That'd be great. So I did about 40 or something stupid, like about 40 of those documentaries in about four or five years. And I guess the key ones that we did that have had a, a bit of a, a legacy for us are things like we did, uh, we did a few with Toby Haydock, we did Looking for Peter and Living with Levine and uh, Haydock versus Havoc that were all a bit more, we were having a bit more of a play, I guess, with the format and, and trying to move away from Talking Heads unless Talking Heads were the right way to do it. Uh, and then the DVD range kind of ended at a point when I guess our confidence was, you know, my confidence was really high and I was thinking, this is great and we can be, we can play with our toys. Uh, and the range ended and I thought, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> not the best time. Uh, and then uh, I went off and did a lot of other work and, and I worked on the Doctor Who after party on BBC Three, which I'm, I think has achieved a certain degree of infamy. It, it, uh, it has. I'm proud it, of that it, infamy. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, mean, but, you know, we're, everyone, everyone just remembers uh, uh, One Direction, <laughs> but... There was a heck of a lot more to it than that. And actually, there was some lovely stuff there, to be fair. To be perfect. Well, I mean, it, 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 its heart was in the right place. And it was produced by, by Russell Minton, who now produces, who now execs the whole Blu-ray range. So Russell's an incredibly important person at the moment in, in, in that kind of, in that culture. Uh, and Russell wanted it to be uh, this beautiful, heartfelt show. And it kind of, it's a whole story on, on itself, but I, I did the, the VTs, basically. I did a, a, most of the VT films, which are really good, which I would defend to the hilt and say, you know, they're, they're lovely. Uh, there's nothing to defend. I think VT, absolutely, <laughs> like I said, the whole thing, the hearts are in the right place, um, and VTs were absolutely spot on. There's nothing to defend, sir. Uh, no, I mean, the rest of it was a car crash. But no, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and basically, off the back of the after party, Russell and I had worked together on that. And then he got the gig of, of bringing out the Blu-ray box sets uh, and, and said, do you want to come and make documentaries again? And, uh, and so I've done, I think, like about 18 or something. I think I worked it out the other day on, on the seven. I think we've have we had seven sets so far, something like seven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So on each set, I tend to do like kind of two or three documentaries. Uh, 
about whatever we've pitched for that set and and I go off and I film with the cast and and the crew and so things that people might have seen uh, we did the weekend with Waterhouse when Toby absolutely. went absolutely absolutely what and and which and, very yeah. much carries on that that theme you were talking about the the things like Levine and all of these kinds of things it's an entirely different take on like you say the talking head um where did that initial spark for 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 that that kind of concept come from yeah i mean i I think it, it's funny, isn't it? I think we, we just want to have as much fun with it as we can. And I personally don't want to feel limited by it at any point. We're given a huge amount of creative freedom on these sets, which is great. And you just think, well, I want to use the form and I want to play. Sometimes that's pastiching kind of different genres and sometimes it's kind of inventing a semi new one. So Talking Heads, I mean, I mean, the, the John Nathan Turner documentary that we've just done, Showman, is, is a talking head film because that's the best way to tell that story. Of because course. you want loads of people and you want to tell a chronological story that doesn't, doesn't muck around with locations, that just tells the story. But when we were doing something like A Weekend with Waterhouse, you know, that's all about that free-flowing, organic sense of Toby and Matthew really getting to know each other. And, and I guess the genesis for that is... Uh, I think when with, with living with Levine, that was very much that same kind of Louis Theroux weird weekend format where somebody come up to Toby on a train and said, do you know what you should do? You should do a, you should go and spend a weekend with John Levine. That'd be really interesting. Uh-huh. And, and Toby said this to me and I said, well, well let, let's pitch it uh, to yeah. Dan Hall at that time. And Dan went for it. And kind of the same thing with Matthew, you know, that we, that I'd always said, I think Matthew's a really interesting figure in Doctor Who, I think Adric is obviously a very uh, Marmite kind of character, you know, where- 100%, think, um, absolutely. You know, the, the, and, and, and that's that's much better than being boring. You know, he, he, there's a lot of people that love him. There's a lot of people that hate him. There's a lot of people that love and hate him in equal measure. And, uh, and I think the, the weird truth is that we find ourselves as fans reflected in him to a degree that we're slightly uncomfortable with. So if absolutely I ever imagine- Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I ever have that dream of, oh, I've been cast in Doctor Who, it's always as a kind of Adric type figure. <laughs> figure. Uh, and, and, right. I, and I kind of, I think it, maybe that's too close to home, but I think Matthew had written that very interesting autobiography where he referred to himself in the third person and, and told a lot of very interesting stories mm. uh, about mm. his life. And we thought, well, that, that would just be, he would just be a very natural figure uh, for us to go and, and get to know beyond Adric and beyond maybe those commentaries where he gets, you know, I think he, he can be quite a shy guy and I think he might get lost in the mix sometimes when you've got Janet and Peter are so strong and, you know, Absolutely great. Absolutely right. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. So it kind of came from that and and, and flowed quite naturally, really. And, and I, I, I know Matthew was quite reticent about doing it because it's quite, you know, those kind of films are quite you know you might see them as quite invasive because we're turning up in your lounge and and filming your blu-ray absolutely (laughs) right absolutely right and it's going to be in the homes of a lot of people you know they're going to get to see so how do you go how do you about go about negotiating that kind of thing i mean you talked about you talked about matthew perhaps being reticent and, and it's totally understandable how would you go about making sure it goes ahead yeah i mean the truth is the only way you can go into that is by thinking it might not go ahead you know you have to go into it thinking I have to be prepared to walk away from this and I have to be prepared to say, maybe this isn't for you and protect Matthew and make sure that he's not signing up for something, you know, if he's got the wrong impression of what it is or maybe how much control he has. Cause you have to go in and say from the beginning, you know, you will see this film, uh, but you don't have editorial control over this film. Uh, we will listen, but we will not necessarily act on what you say and you need to trust us enough to be okay with that. And you have to be upfront with that at the beginning or you're, you're ripping somebody off. Uh, so I, I would always say what I did with Matthew certainly was I, I, I said, uh, I know you're not sure, uh, but can I come and have a chat? Can I come and meet you? And I went down to Hastings. I drove from Bristol to Hastings and sat with Matthew and just talked him through it. And, and, and I guess my main uh, approach with these films is always to say I know we've only got the John Levine film to show you and you might think that is you know that's a certain that's a John Levine film and but that's not necessarily what your film's going to be like you know the film reflects who you are and where you are in your life and and I want to immerse you know I want it to be an immersive experience based on the truth of of you and I and I, I don't know really what his thought process was but he that seemed to reassure him and I think his husband Tim was was kind of quite pro the idea of you know this will be fun 
yeah. and, uh, and and Matthew signed on for it. Uh, he could have easily not. Uh, and I'm sure as the range goes on, there's a few more of those I'd love to do. There's a kind of list of people I'd love to do that with. I'm sure some of them will say no, just because it, it won't be right for everybody. But I hope they would watch the Matthew film and think, you know, that's great. This isn't a stitch up. This isn't kind of making fun of Matthew. This is uh, just a, a more thoughtful uh, way of, of getting to know somebody, hopefully. Yeah, I think so. And I think that I think it's I think it's incredibly successful. And I think, uh, yeah, just about anyone who buys the sets would be would be incredibly up for for seeing some more of those. How do you yeah. go about um, choosing a subject? Not necessarily for that, but 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 just in general, uh, um, when you come to to think about a, a new season, um, how, how do you start kicking ideas around? Uh, yeah, well, I, I did this recently. <laughs> I probably scared Russell a bit because I made <laughs> a document of every season we've got left to do. <laughs> it was about a 15-page doc of just, <laughs> you could do this, 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 this. And I'm sure, you know, other ideas will come forward, but I just wanted to, I wanted to try and figure out where, what we could do where. And, and I guess with any of those seasons on that list, I was looking at the season. I, I got all the DVDs out and I looked through them and thought, well, what, what's been done, first of all? You know, if we've done making ofs on every story, we're not going to do any more making ofs. Mm, but maybe absolutely. there are some gaps. You know, maybe there are some omissions that we can fix. Maybe there are some omissions that should probably be left as omissions because there's just maybe, you know, there's a few stories where you think, well, what, what, what can you do with that beyond just ticking the box of saying, here's a making of, it's rubbish. But here it absolutely, is. yeah. Uh, and, and, and hopefully, it, you know, a, a lot of that is looking at it thinking, well, it sounds awful, but who's alive, you know, who's alive and happy to take part in this kind of thing. And what could we form around them? And sometimes that's me then reaching out to people like Toby Haydock and Richard Bignall and saying, have I missed anything? You know, is there anything, if we were going to do a looking for, like the looking for Peter thing, are there any figures from this season that that would be uh, suitable for? Uh, and sometimes it's just a mad idea. Excuse me. And, I think a lot of the time I'm, we've got about, we've ended up with about five different series strands of documentary now. Uh, things like the doctor's table and the writer's room and the weekend with and the revisited strand and all these kind of little playful different versions. And I'd lo I want to keep them all bubbling away. So you're looking each season to think, you know, what can we fit where? Of course, Some seasons of course. are going to be really hard. You know, some seasons I think where there's loads of making ofs already, and sadly, everybody's passed away. You know, we're going to be, I think that's where you end up with documentaries, which are more, I'll be looking more towards, say, the new series, you know, or other, uh, other eras of the show and taking personalities from those eras and applying their eyes to the older stuff. Do you, do you know what I mean? Kind of trying to... But, but it works very it. well. It works very well in the behind the sofa things. It's an it's interesting yeah, to yeah. see um, because they've got their take on their time. But actually, looking at you know uh, the differences between whether it was something far before they joined, something after they joined, I think it's always interesting to hear. So actually, I think that's a really good approach to take. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And, and every series is, is different like that, you know. And, and there might suddenly be a new opportunity, or somebody's in the country, or there's a little bit of budget spared to do something else and 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 we can you know we did a little documentary uh about brendan from uh, k9 and company which is purely just a opportunistic realization that we could and he was a gap and wouldn't that be nice to do and and you go off and you film a 10 minute documentary to fill that gap so it's it, it's very organic um and and i'm sure the ideas we have now i hope we'll have lots of other ideas before the end of it but there's a lot, as I say, it's, the big appealing thing to me is there's a huge amount of creative freedom with that. To be in, a, in, a, in an extraordinary situation, really, that with telly, you're so worried about, are we going to hit every different type of audience member? And will that kind of humour or that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, amount of information, will that work for everybody? And, and with these, we can say, well, we, we are able to make a documentary in a televisual way in a proper tv way but for such a niche audience it's kind of insane really it's kind of an insane situation but it's but it's i mean it's the most self-indulgent thing in the world but in in the loveliest way i think certainly a way that i really enjoy hey, absolutely and in a way that that pretty much is i think it's unique really uh, doctor who uh, 
allows Doctor Who fans generally allow those kinds of things. Most are fairly <laughs> playful and do enjoy the kind of approach that you take. And that's borne out in sales. These things are, I would say, flying off the shelves. They never make it to shelves. They're absolutely, <laughs> you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're got, they go on sale, they're gone. Um, we know, uh, 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 well, a lot, a lot of us know that maybe hang around on Doctor Who forums far more than we should, um, that there have been problems uh, for people grabbing hold of, of season 14. Uh, for example, there were, there were similar issues around season 12. Um, is there anything you can kind of tell us about that? Because I think people, people are looking, I think, for some sort of reassurance that do I carry on collecting if I can't get hold of these, these things in future or do I give up now? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly sympathise. You know, I, I I follow the forums and and I, and and I, I feel the pain. You know, I can see the ang- the anxiety that that it causes, and I'm and I and I wish that wasn't the case. Uh, I think that uh, it's hard to know quite what the BBC will do with that in, in the future, and it's not really the side of things that I'm involved in because almost the sales side of it is almost completely separate from the actual production side of of the, the range. Uh, I think it was really encouraging that when season 12 was a, obviously a more limited run when it first arrived, uh, that then the subsequent seasons were, a, were were bigger runs. And so seasons like I think 26 and 23 are still available now. I, th- I think you can still go on and get them now. Uh, and, and that they were then able to look back at season 12 and say, well, we should re-release that. And I know that re-release had, it, had its own issues. Uh, <laughs> I think season 14 is a unique one in terms of the climate that we're in at the moment, you know, as, as everybody knows, you know, I think it's been, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of this, but from what I can see as an observer, it looks like it's been influenced by, by the complications that have been going on. I know people, a few places like Amazon and Zoom have had a few uh, mishaps in terms of the numbers they were expecting and all this. Uh, I hope, I genuinely hope that, that there will be uh an opportunity in the future for people to get the sets that they want because I think a collection you know you have to be able to collect it uh, so I genuinely hope that happens uh, but I, d- I really don't have any intel to be able to say anything definite on, on that it's purely a, a hope I, I mean I it would just seem to be logical to me as a fan that the BBC would want to encourage people to come into that range yeah. So, you know, I, I, you know it, it's, it's, it's purely a guess I, I the what I would say is obviously if somebody felt like they'd really missed out then i know that the range is available in other in other territories and and i know that's not a consistent shelf but at least it's the same content so i would certainly say if you've missed it in the uk then there may be other territories you can acquire that from i would certainly say scalpers are the absolute sin of the universe and uh, the idea of people buying 10 copies of this i know it's i know you'd say well it's kind of our fault for not making enough but i i would ethically morally say if you're buying these and then selling them on for inflated prices then i kind of hate you and, and <laughs> not gonna I, I, I think that's a i think that's a general feeling a general feeling um yeah i guess that's <laughs> capitalism and unless we start rising yeah. up like the doctor him no, or herself no. and uh, and crushing those systems it's just always <laughs> going to be it's always going to no, be the I mean, way it is but you know it doesn't rest on your head i guess my concern is that the wonderful content that you as a team put together doesn't get to be seen by all the people that really deserve to see it because it's brilliant yeah. stuff and the effort you put in that's my and as as a fan and as someone yeah. who loves these things that's my concern you know and i completely agree and I, and, and and it's frustrating for us i mean it's great i mean anything we can anything i can support that keeps the range going and keeps the bbc happy with the sales of the range you know you hear stories about the dvds you know huge numbers being left on the shelves and they get returned to the bbc and that's not a good thing for the longevity of the range so the range is in in great health you know nobody needs to worry about the the future of the range you know i think it's a very buoyant happy healthy situation uh, but I agree with you. I, I hate the idea of particularly new fans wanting to get into it and being scuppered, you know, and, and I know we can't blame the scalpers. Uh, you know, the scalpers are not, are not the, the entire cause of that situation. Uh, you know, it would be great if there were more copies, but, you know, I, I'm sure that situation will evolve. And I don't think anybody would think it's a lock on. This is exactly how we do it. I think every new situation the BBC find themselves in will 
probably influence the way things evolve into the next phase. So I, I, I hope to see that nobody is disappointed. So how far ahead do you plan? How far ahead do you look? I mean, I think, uh, certainly for myself, what I've been taken by surprise is just how quickly, it may not seem quickly to you, but as a fan, it seems that these are coming quickly, not rushed, but far quicker than I would have thought, given the love, care and attention that goes into every aspect of them. So they're coming at quite a rate. How far ahead are you, are you guys thinking? I mean, we're thinking uh, all the way through. You know, we're thinking right the way, I mean, this, this pitch I made the other day was, was every single season of the original run. Uh, and I'd love to pitch the new stuff as well. I'd, you know, I, I, course, I didn't think that course. would just overwhelm entirely. Uh, so we're pitching for everything. Uh, but in practical terms, you know, you're dealing with uh, a group of people who are, who are very specialist in their skills. You know, you've got people like Peter Crocker, uh, of, formerly of the restoration team, where it, it's really down to Peter that the episodes look the way they do. And Peter's the key person in that. So, you, you know, you can only work at the pace that Peter as a human being can, can do. It's not a big of team of people. And you wouldn't want it to be a big team of people when you've got someone like that. And equally, Mark Ayres, you know, working on the audio is such a specialist. So, you know, there's a certain rate at which we can get ahead. You know, we can't get so far ahead with it, with the size of the team. Uh, but we're certainly editing at the moment uh, documentaries for the next couple of sets. Um, and then obviously other releases like Fury from the Deep and things like that. You know, there's there's more and more kind of synergy, I guess, to use an awful word, between the the, the, the bits of the release schedule. So... Probably at any one time, I'm working on the next couple and maybe planning the one after that, I guess, is the, the rule of thumb. Excellent. Excellent. Um, on that note, then, come on, give us some kind <laughs> of clue. Give us some, what's, what's on the horizon? Can you, I'm, I, I've no <laughs> doubt you'll never tell me a season number. How about uh, an actor that you may have been working with? I can tell you a format. Okay. I can tell you a format. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, actually any, any person I tell you will, will, will get bigger. And I know people think we're being kind of trolls, you know, when we're, you know, uh, we're, when we're holding back this stuff. But I, I, I think Russell's made such a lovely thing of when those season trailers come out and they come from nowhere. Annoyingly, Amazon have to put things up first thing in the morning, but then the trailer comes out and, and it's a genuine shock for people. And, and I, think, I think that's lovely and that's something to be retain that shock and surprise even if you think oh yeah i knew what it was going to be uh with with we've we're just finishing at the moment a new doc which i hope will be the first of a series um what can i say <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't even name it because the name might change you see I, I might get notes back when it goes of to course. russell to say i don't of like course. the name uh but basically it's uh and this doesn't tell you which season it is because I've worked it out. This can I can do this for about eight or nine different seasons on the on the original series very happily, uh, but it's all kind of based on the idea. It's about directors, and you know we did writers in the writers' room, and I didn't just want to put directors in a pub for a chat because it you know we just feel like we're regurgitating ourselves. Cool. Uh, but I thought the interesting about directors on Doctor Who is that they they work independently. They work in their separate bubbles on their separate shows and never the twain shall meet and you never get a sense of what they think about each other's shows what they think about each other and the way that that the other director works and they themselves don't know because any director is in this quite narrow field of not getting to see how other directors direct um, and so this new format this new series is like is essentially a director's road trip it's where we have a london black cab uh, and a number of directors not necessarily from the season in question uh but we send them out on uh a kind of a mad road trip to try and hit all the different locations of that season of doctor who to revisit their location and the other directors locations from that run and and look at clips and explore and say well i wouldn't have done it like that or uh why is he why has he done it? What's happened here? Oh, this bit. Look what he's done here. I would never have thought of that. That's amazing. How, you know. I think, I think that's a wonderful, really great idea. As someone who slightly obsessed with Doctor Who locations, love going on a yeah. location hunt, <laughs> then, I, you know, you've, you've already, already sold it to me. But I love that idea. Again, it comes back to 
uh, mixing up people who weren't necessarily involved in any yeah. given production. I think it's a great idea. Um, surely gives it a, a fresh new new approach. Definitely, yeah. And and I just think I think so much of what the Blu-ray range has done is is about that interaction. Is about putting together uh, different combinations of people and seeing what it unlocks and and this one is definitely like that and we've done a lot more with you know i think i saw i've, I've done, done a lot of filming with drones uh for, for for telly for things like our school as you say um yeah. but i i was i really like what pete mati did on the fenwick uh making of when they had the drone above the beach in the church and i thought why haven't i done that yet <laughs> uh, and so the next couple of ones we've done since then thanks to pete uh, are, are very droney. So this location one is very much, you know, it's it's location porn, basically. It's taking the Richard Bignall now and then format and really, you know, pumping that up to extreme degrees. And, and, and so you will see these locations that are iconic and that I love uh, in a completely different way. And that's not just blowing smoke up. It, it, they, they really look amazing and you get to hear about them in a different way. So, so that, that, that's the, that's the, the, that's an exclusive for you guys, but it's the, that, that's the one I'd love to kind of take forward and, and to be quite playful. And I love the idea of even air dropping in like a new series director, like a Joe Ahern or kind of, or kind of Eros Lynn or someone like that into, into an, into that road trip and getting a, com a completely different generational perspective as a director, you know, all the things for health and safety, you know, if you're doing, if you're, Douglas Camfield and you're filming Inferno, you know, no modern director will get to run around an installation like that, you know, no. you know, in the modern day, you know, it's just, it's just, just not going to ab happen. Absolutely not. The one that's coming to me as a, as a location lover um, is, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the set's already out, so I'm going to have to ask you to already revisit <laughs> season 12 okay. uh, and get everyone do down Wookiee Hole Caves. That's the one I want to see. But <laughs> my, my, uh, you, can never, you can never make enough extra content about Revenge of the Cybermen, as far as I'm concerned, but everyone's bored of me going on about Revenge. Special, special, special edition of... Uh, absolutely. Super duper Listen. special edition. Of, 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 <laughs> I'm, no, I'm happy you... to help pitch. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I filmed in Wookie Hole recently after season 12 came out uh -huh. because I thought we were going to tell the story in, in the new Liz Sladen documentary we've done. I mm. thought we were going to tell the story of her, her near-death experience in Wookie Hole. Yeah. Uh, and so I went and because, uh, as you may, might have seen, we, we, we did this stuff where I take a camera around all the locations of our life and, and, and I took one to Wookie Hole and we didn't get to use it in the end. And it, but it looked beautiful. Like Wookie Hole is such a beautiful... It's and they light it so stunning. nicely these days and stunning it's, place. It's but we can a struggle. Use I mean, I, I, was, I was there last year doing a lovely location visit myself. Um, and you're right. It's difficult to take a bad photograph in those caves. Yeah. The place looks lovely. And being yeah. the age it is, it looks exactly as it did in, in, <laughs> in 1975 uh, when, when they were down there filming this. So you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely spot. So anything <laughs> location wise, I'm perfectly <laughs> happy with that. You mentioned yeah. um, there uh, for season 14. Let me move on to season 14. You talked about the Our Sarah Jane uh, documentary, mm. which is getting rave reviews. Um, I read just before you and I spoke, I was, I was having a quick look to see generally what people are thinking. I know it's positive. Um, but the main thing seems to be that you're making people cry. Was that your aim? <laughs> I know. I never know whether to apologise or not. That would be people say, <laughs> you've broken me. Uh, no, it's been, uh, I mean, the reaction so far has been, been genuinely kind of lovely and humbling and, and, and I'm really, really grateful for everybody who's watched it and enjoyed it. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are still to watch it. So it, the rest of, of the population might decide they hate it, possibly. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it's been a really big one for us. You know, it's a 77 minute doc and that's always going to be a big process. Um, and I think more than more than most of these ones, I feel a real uh, responsibility to to Liz's family, you know, to Sadie and Brian, and and making sure that they're happy and 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 making something that seems like, you know, it doesn't need to be a glowing reflection, but a fair reflection of, of Liz, you know, a celebration that can also, you know, we talk about also, you know, Liz's side as as you know that she could be a, a bit of a warrior and she could be unsure of her own ability. But I think she's got such an amazing uh, life story, really, you know, that sense of a very young success who, you know, unfortunately ends up a little bit typecast through no fault of her own 
and and mostly those stories end like that you know they end quite sadly and with somebody put out to pasture and i love that with liz incredibly rarely uh this amazing renaissance happens to her so you can have this this really feel good uh last act to the film which you know obviously ultimately ends in 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 a far too early a, a departure but it's amazing that liz has that comeback and we really wanted to celebrate that that old maxim of how she'd become a hero to two different different generations which i think is so is so powerful um so no it's, it's lovely to see it going down well i think that tom in particular uh has been upsetting me people that tom baker we you know obviously has so much love for liz you know then yeah, and now I, which has always been always been abundantly clear but but not not more so than than in the in this documentary yeah no i, I think we I've interviewed Tom once before when we did the Sharda making of, and, and, and he was great for us then. Uh, we mucked up the sound entirely, so we couldn't use as much of him as we wanted to that time. But uh, uh, this time around, he was just really, I think he was having, he was on really good form. I think he uh, has so much natural affection for Liz that he was just overjoyed. We were just really happy to be sharing those memories and talking about it and very happy to go into the, the different bits that I wanted to talk to him about. So it was just a really lovely day that we spent with, well, I think he was, must've been on camera for about an hour and a half or so with Tom. Uh, and, and obviously the, there were a few moments in the film when he gets quite upset and, and that was upsetting for us on the day, you know, behind the camera, you know, you're the, the evil git part of you is going, Oh, we're recording. <laughs> and, and the other part of you is saying, this is my hero. And he's, you know, my, my TV hero and he's upset and that's really upsetting. So absolutely, I'm really it's glad a, that we could include that. Yeah. Oh God, absolutely right. And it's the right thing to do. I mean, I've got a list. I, I, I have made a list of the contents <laughs> of season 14 because there's okay. no way I could even pretend to remember everything that's on there. Um, I think it's easy as Doctor Who fans to almost take it for granted. There is genuinely no other series I know of that gets this kind of love. We have already had the DVD range. You would expect that maybe it would be sharpened up and just di dumped directly onto Blu-ray discs. It's not the case. We get all of that content. Plus, new commentaries, new surround sounds. Uh, we have got Behind the Sofa, which are lovely little things. Our Sarah Jane we've just talked about revisiting the Who's Doctor Who documentary. Um, you've got Matthew Sweet talking to Philip Hinchcliffe, the lovely trailer that we talked about earlier. Rare archive yeah. material, convention footage, it goes on and on and on. Um, is there ever a point where you get to where you go, do you know what guys, maybe we've got too much? Well, I would say no. <laughs> I, 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 I was, well, I think I always look at the sets and I always have a moment of thinking, have we? put in enough new stuff is, is there enough new stuff in that and and you know and i think in this case it's a season where uh, the, the making of has already already been done so it's not like season 19 where quite a lot of the making of were missing so you could do quite a lot of smaller documentaries mm. with the same kind of kind of people and that could be quite cost effective on this one you have to go off in different directions and do different things because everything else has been told already so i always get a pang of is there enough stuff? And, 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 and maybe that's the thing driving the range because I know people like Russell will always look at it. And I think, for instance, I could be lying here, but there's a, a, an interview with, with uh, the Richard Latto uh, produced uh, with uh, Deep Roy, with Mr. Sin on, on this one. And I think that was probably quite a late commission just because there was an opportunity there to approach Deep and there was a sense of, oh, what are we missing? You know, we haven't, you know, what, uh, Deep's never been involved in in this set. So we should, that's a gap we should fill, isn't it? And I Absolutely think everybody right. on the range is coming from that same perspective as a fan of thinking, what would I like to see and what would I be disappointed not to see? And uh, the key figures in that are people like Russell and Pete Matee, who acts as consultants on it, are always looking for those things. And, and I'm always thinking about it um, with the docs that we do. But I would, I would say we're, we're always going to try and do as much as, as we can and we're always going to think well you know i mean I, it would have been nice i would have been interested to do a people have talked about i think doctor who magazine talked about as well the whether there should have been a, a race uh, documentary of some kind 
about about talons and of course yeah absolutely and discussion about talons and 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 you know in in the defense of the box there, there, there have been documentaries about race on the range before which will be included on the box set but it's a fair comment to say you could do something really specific about talons not about race in general because we've done that but maybe something about talons because that story feels like it's developed more in the years since the dvds have come out and it's a story that deserves to be uh, heard uh but in that situation you think well i mean i personally think you know the things i pitched for first ahead of that were a liz sladen documentary and a who's doctor who documentary and i wouldn't change that you know i wouldn't i wouldn't I wouldn't kind of remove either of those docs in order to make another doc. So if, if, if the budget was there, you know, you think, well, I, that would be a really interesting discussion type documentary to mount. Um, so, you know, so even, even with something like 14, I, I look at it and think, well, it, it would have been lovely to do that too. And we just couldn't squ quite squeeze it in. It's nothing more political than that. It's just a, how much can we get out of this budget to, to, to bring the set together? So, I think we're always looking at it thinking that there could have been a little bit more. Well, when Blu-rays are superseded by, I don't know, some clear little plastic cube. Holograms. Yeah, we can then, do holograms. Well, listen, th that's when you can start <laughs> adding these extra things so that we've then got three sets of, uh, of, <laughs> of extra material. I'm on uh, board. I, yeah, I don't I'm, know if I'm I can cope. <laughs> I don't know if I can, as a, as a fan, you know, kind of getting, having them up on the shelf. I don't know. I mean, I think, I hope that whatever happens in the future now, that will kind of keep the keep these boxes and just put discs in instead or something, you know, like they they did that on the James Bond Blu-rays, didn't they? That that they left a gap for Quantum of Solace or something. But uh, I'd love to not have to throw these out. I'd love to be able to say these ones are staying now, and uh, and and that's fine. And we'll just if if somebody Philip Morris comes back with Daleks Master Plan or whatever, then we'll just plonk that that disc in into the existing set. I hope. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Would, Listen, would be wonderful. Chris, it's been wonderful to talk to you. <laughs> before we go, you, before we go, anything, however cryptic, one last tease of what's coming up. <laughs> well, I told you about a whole series of stuff. <laughs> I know. You can't, you got, you can't no. blame a guy for trying. No, it's okay. I, 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 that, that is the only thing I can give you that's not spoilery, really. Because every whatever, whatever I mention now, somebody on the internet will be like, "Well, well, that could only be this one." And, and so, listen, so, no, it, I can't. It'll keep can't people busy. Here. It keeps right. people busy. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's because but, we know, love I'm, what I'm, you do. Oh well, that's that's kind. Thank you. And 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 I guess the important thing is we. It's a, it's a, it sounds a bit trite, but we genuinely love what we do. So uh, hopefully we can keep doing it. I'm sure we'll keep doing it. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for chatting to me. It's been really nice. Thanks ever so much. Chris, you take care and we'll catch up soon. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.